So let me say, uh, welcome everyone to uh, uh, COVID State of Play, um, which is an irregular series, at least for the duration of um, the pandemic, uh, hosted by myself and my wonderful colleague, Margaret Bordeaux, uh, about what's going on with COVID and uh, what we should be doing about it, what bigger lessons we can learn from it, and uh, indeed what might be in front of our noses, but maybe not so often noticed. And uh, for today's session, we're gonna talk about environmental and racial justice issues. We have two wonderful guests for that purpose. And uh, I'll turn it over to Margaret for those introductions. Just a warning that is um, uh, suited for our times. This is being recorded at least by us and probably by others and uh, will be made an historical artifact immediately after the event uh, is over. If you have questions you wanna ask, there's a Q and A tool at the bottom of the screen and you can punch those in and might find them addressed during the session or after and those two can be made a record of uh, what goes on. So Margaret, uh, over to you to uh, make introductions and to start us off with figuring out the state of play since we last gathered. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. I'm also hoping my dog doesn't <laughs> burst in from behind the screen here I, I have behind me. So apologize if I get interrupted by a, a canine force of nature. Um, I am so, so thrilled to um, have our session today uh, with two just um, amazing thinkers um, about COVID and about the larger issues uh, involved um, in what we're seeing and what we're experiencing in this epidemic. Um, the first is Dr. Michelle Morse, uh, who is an internal medicine and public health doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, where I sit as well, and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. She co-founded Equal Health, an organization that builds critical consciousness and collective action towards globally, globally towards achieving health equity. And in September of last year, she began her Robert Wood Johnson's Health Policy Fellowship and is placed on the Ways and Means Committee uh, majority staff, working with the committee staff on health equity priorities. So she has gotten a um, sort of incredible set of perspectives uh, during this um, most unusual year, uh, both um, as, a, as a practitioner, a provider, um, a policy thinker, and now um, working on the Hill. Uh, and also we have uh, Ms. Jackie Patterson. Uh, Jacqueline Patterson is the Senior Director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Uh, she has worked as a researcher, an advocate, an activist, and on a wider range of issues, including racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. So, um, uh, robust look at justice and uh, in all of the ways that it uh, uh, comes together as an issue. Um, so. Oh no. You guys kind of okay. with a question we often start with, um, which is, you know, what is this, what is the state of play uh, with, with COVID? Um, and sometimes Jonathan will, will ask, you know, if you can give us kind of one word or uh, two words of uh, how you think things are, are going with the with the COVID crisis. Uh, what comes to what comes to mind, um, and then we can kind of delve jump backwards into kind of what brought you to the game, and and also take a forward look. Who would you like to go first? Let's see, um, Jackie. Can we start with you? Sure. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so it's an honor to be here with you and I appreciate this conversation. Looking forward to this uh, discussion very much. I, you know, it's hard because uh, you started off in such a light and positive way. And when you said one word, <laughs> my word was devastating. So I felt like, wow, what a downer. Um, so um, so that's just a caveat to lead in, <laughs> but um, yeah. And at the risk of it being more of a downer, can I ask Jackie, is it, I bet it's been devastating for quite a while. Is what's the slope of the curve for you? Is it attenuating or is it getting worse? A little bit of both. You know, I mean, I would say in some ways, in some ways, it's obviously getting worse, just in terms of the the, the sheer numbers and mm -hmm. 
in some ways it's getting worse in terms of the cliff we're about to fall off of in terms of the moratoriums and so forth and the gap between what's, you know, between, um, between kind of the, the cessation, cessation of those much needed supports and the incoming administration that will, will conceivably turn around, turn things around and offer a better suite of supports. So, and there you mean economic supports in particular? Yeah, mm -hmm. among others, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that, so there's that. And um, also support in terms of, in terms of actually uh, some, some common sense ways of actually dealing with um, contain, uh, containing this the, the situation. So really um, uh, shifting an, a narrative from uh, wearing masks as a theft of liberty to wearing, wearing masks as, a, as an act of public health and, and, and collective care. So there's a, there's a whole, you know, so economics is just part of it, but there's a whole shift in mentality and approach to, to actually addressing Mm -hmm. um, this worsening situation. So, so that part, but then on, on a positive side, I would also say that there is a dawning recognition of the depth of the systemic, uh, the systemic vulnerabilities and the inequities in a way that really there's, I, I keep quoting um, Mayor Steve, ben, Steve Benjamin from Columbia, South Carolina, with whom I was on a panel, panel and he said that COVID acted as um, an x-ray to expose the broken bones of America's society. And so that, that, that in and of itself, and, and another quote from, an older quote from James Baldwin that uh, nothing can be changed unless, what, let's see, until, what is it? Nothing can be changed unless it's faced or not everything that's that, that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it's faced. And so, um, so really, the recognition that we have as a society of the really truly bro broken bones of our of our of our, um, of our systems is gives us some hope of of actually recognizing the level of systemic change that's, that's going to be necessary to provide security for everyone. So. Well, Jackie, you don't know this, but but you have just um, just done exactly what I the, you serve the function that I usually serve on most meetings uh, at the Berkman Klein Center, where everyone kind of goes around and is talking about cool things that are they're learning or whatever, and then I'm like, oh, this is horrible. This, <laughs> this is you know this is you know I'm so angry, and it's been you know months and months of, of me of me doing that, and I it, I almost hate to have them turn to me and ask. <laughs> <I'm> like I <laughs> I wish I think uh, so. So your 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 comment is is your word is well taken, and it stacks up well uh, with um with our with comments on our previous episodes and um so you're definitely not not out of place and you're also playing a little bit of a validator to me so um that's that's helpful um michelle did what would you do you like yeah i i have to second what what jackie said um so deeply i think i i have also felt like some of this just in in this year some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows um in my you know 15 years of doing this kind of work um around health equity and global health and um and i just i think that that x-ray analogy is I mean it gave me goosebumps it really it really says it all and 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 for me similarly um, you know Jackie and Margaret it's if I had to think of one word it's tragedy because it's because it truly is um, and it, and the way that COVID has played out in the United States is uh, you know again uh, a centuries-old pattern um, that we have been unable to and unwilling to interrupt and break from and and on the the reason I say I've had my highest highs and my lowest lows in this year um, is because you know number one seeing how the management of this pandemic within the United States has been um, just so um, uh, wrong at every step in in so many ways at the at the national level at the federal level and at the same time. Um, I have had experiences of connectedness and solidarity that are deeper 
um, than anything I've ever experienced in my 15 years of doing this work. And, and the example I'll just share is supporting um, the work of the Movement for Black Lives during the Juneteenth, Juneteenth mobilizations that happened all around the country and, and even some places outside of the United States. Um, and, and you know, folks asking the question, well, how can we do this safely in the middle of a once in a century pandemic and can we? Um, and the group of health workers and organizers and healers that we brought together said, well, you know, protesting saves lives. And so how can we do this in a way that is a harm reduction approach, right? Where we, we do things as safely as we possibly can, um, but also support people who want to demonstrate and express their right to protest because of how profoundly tragic and violent George Floyd's murder was. And, and that should not be curbed. Um, and what we found, of course, was, you know, we, we made recommendations like, you know, wear your mask, of course, and uh, bring your hand sanitizer and, and space out as much as you can. And, you know, instead of using those big bull horns where you're, you're kind of spinning on everybody, um, you know, bring your drums and your, and your, you know, musical instruments and find other ways to make noise that are just a touch safer in the middle of a pandemic like this. Um, but also, I think what we felt in that moment was that we are going to get us out of this pandemic mm -hmm. and the solidarity and the, the relationships that were built out of that experience um, were some of the, the deepest and, and most profound conversations, um, relationships and experiences I've ever had. And of course, what was shown afterwards was that, you know, study, a study of over 300 US cities, right, looking at whether or not those protests led to increased transmission of COVID um, showed that it didn't in fact, right? And so it was just another example of, of us taking care of us and of us keeping each other safe um, and of us demonstrating our solidarity um, in a way that you know, certainly influenced the election results. So, um, so a lot of, like I said, high highs and, and low lows for sure for me. Jackie, I sort of see you shaking your head uh, at some of what she said. I, I, I guess I'm curious to know, you know, it's been a devastating experience. I'm wondering, as this started, as the epidemic started, did you see that, you know, you, you're so well versed in so many different angles and conversations around justice. Did you think it would play out in this way? Um, and, and when I say this way, maybe we can also be a little bit more specific about the inequities and disparities um, that we have seen uh, play out uh, in, in COVID, um, the magnitude of those um, and, uh, you know, and be a little bit more specific about, about what, we're, what we're talking about in terms of how this has been um, you know, played out with more, much more burden on Black and Hispanic communities in particular. Um, yeah. I know, so were you surprised, I guess, Jackie? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it's interesting because uh, I was uh, actually taking a very small um, four-day vacation when things really started to kind of pick up in terms of people recognize, you know, when and that was back when it was just the, the nursing home in Washington state. And maybe it was just beginning to emerge about the, the hot spot in New Rochelle. And so I was, uh, I, at that time it was, it was around March the 9th when I sat down and spent like a 19 hour period just writing this document called the 10 equity implications of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. And it, and it all came to pass and more. And it wasn't like a, an act of prophecy by any stretch. It was just a repeating of the same patterns that we've seen in other disasters in, in, a, in microcosm, whether it's Hurricane Katrina or you know, the ways that climate change impacts are, are rolling out in general. It's, a, it's very parallel and it's all based on this analysis around the broken 
the broken bones of American society. So if you just know, and you know, it's if you just know um, those systemic factors, then you can all you can predict how they're going to play out in any given situation. And so, so yes, to some extent, it was clear. And anybody who's working on the front lines of this work would also be able to. To, to draw the same conclusions in terms of how it's going to, to roll out. Um, so, and at the same time, the thing that I didn't kind of rec realize is the extent of, well, certainly didn't anticipate the extent to which the, 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 the mask uh, liberty uh, nexus would, um, would really, roll out in such a deep and 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 unbelievable way <laughs> just in terms of you know whether it's the acts of violence around around um mask conflicts around mask wearing or uh you know person to person or it's people showing up armed at the state house in in michigan like that that's something that i never never could have even conceived of you know of course masks weren't even a, a conversation back then but but those kind of things are, but but the one thing that we we did know was um, would would result is just the civil unrest that would come from something that is that has intensified to such an extent, the way this has. So I'll, I'll leave it there to any you know in honor of brevity, but yeah. And you've talked, you know, extensively and written extensively about this sort of legacy, uh, you know, that this COVID, the COVID crisis is really just one more example of, you know, how uh, historically marginalized communities uh, or marginalized, currently marginalized communities um, uh, suffer in response to some type of, of, of natural disaster or human made disaster. Um, can, can you talk just a little bit about the connections th that we see with what's happening with COVID? How is it similar to Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil spill sort of specifically? Sure, yeah. So just very specifically is, is the, is the pre-existing, the pre-existing vulnerabilities, like systemic vulnerabilities. So whether it is where people are living and we know that that has you know come about from everything from you know historic slavery to the ways that people weren't able to hand down property because of lack of legal legal standing to do so to um, historic redlining to modern day redlining and all of that resulting in people living in places that leave them more likely to be in harm's way and less likely to have protective infrastructure. So whether it's people living in, um, in places where the levees aren't, aren't reinforced or aren't properly invested in and therefore had seen more impacts from Katrina or it's people who are living in places where PM 2.5, the particulate matter load in the air is high and other pollutants are in the air are, are, are extreme and therefore making our lungs more compromised and therefore when we have any type of shock to the system like the COVID-19, you know, and certainly Dr. Morris can speak more to, to this than I can, but um, that we are, are more likely to suffer the extreme impacts um, there. So that though, though, those are just a couple of concrete examples. Then also when we look at climate change as a whole and we see that shifts in agricultural yields is one of the impacts of climate change. And we, we know that from those same historic factors that um, already African, before this whole thing started already, 26% of African-Americans according to, um, to, to studies are, um, are food insecure already. And so then when we have the situation of, of, uh, of COVID-19, then, and we're, we're also kind of compromised by uh, the, we, we know that the, the work insecurity has also made our economic situation more vulnerable as well. Then those things combine, you know, places of residence and more likely to live in places that don't have access to healthy and nutritious, nutritious foods, not being able to, um, not being able to continue to work in the same way that we were able to work to buy food. 
and and then now shifts in agricultural yields from climate change and all of this combining to exacerbate food insecurity in our communities. So yet, yet another example, there's so many examples, but those are just a couple to give a bit of a sense, yeah. Right, so, you know, I, I guess um, the dividing it up a little bit and like, okay, you have uh, vulnerabilities, you also have increased exposure uh, with um, folks being uh, needing to, let's say, go to work uh, and not being able to, you know, not having sick leave, not having uh, child care, not having the supports, they have to, you know, have to have the, the, the paycheck and they have to go out into the community where they would be, you know, more exposed. Um, and then after exposure, you know, dealing with, okay, having less um, access to care. Uh, you know, kind of the whole continuum uh, lined up and stacked up against, um, you know, well, against a, a large swath of, of different communities uh, that, that intersect with that, that profile in different ways. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly um, I, I think your, your, your point of the x-ray uh, is, is quite valid. There's so many breaks in the bones that it's um, sort of, uh, I guess, sort of a little bit hard to, um, you know, it's it's a, it's a whole picture, and and rather than a you know a very pinpointed uh, fracture, um, Michelle, I I think one of the things that I have struggled with in, in sort of delving into this is there's always a lot of hearing all of the ways that people are vulnerable, all the ways that they're differentially exposed, all the you know lack of resources that they might have to be able to. Um, cope with a crisis like this, it sort of feels overwhelming. You know, it feels like there's no remedy because it's so ex ex expansive and so global. I, I don't know, Michelle, if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, you've taken some really interesting uh, work on in terms of, you know, drilling down and trying to unpack and unwind some of the um, issues in medical care and racism and systemic racism in medical care uh, here in Boston. And um, I, I don't know whether you can speak a little bit to that of like, well, okay, given all of these bad things, how can you actually dig in and, and try to move the needle on uh, making it less so? Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to try. And, and again, just um, really, really appreciate the analysis that, that Jackie put forward. I, um, couldn't agree more. <laughs> couldn't agree more. And it's and it's as as you said, it's also interconnected. Um, and I th I think um, yeah, I, the the layers are are many, <laughs> um, too numerous to count, as they say. Um, and at the same time, I think so much of how, especially for for folks who are in in healthcare in in the in the work of of doing service delivery and taking care of patients. Um, it can be hard to zoom out sometimes and recognize how all those different layers are actually determining and defining the very choices that you're making at the bedside or the prescription that you're writing or the uh, discharge plan that you're developing or, or whatever it might be. It can be really hard to see those connections, um, particularly in the urgency of, of what clinical care is every day on the normal, let alone in the middle of a tragedy like the COVID pandemic. Um, and so I think um, we have to use theory. We have to use, you know, and learn from, from social science frameworks to really help us to um, expand our aperture, I guess, and, and really um, look beyond the biomedical model, right, which is so ingrained in the way that we're trained that we, you know, can't see the air that we're breathing, right? We don't even recognize that we're missing a whole series of layers of forces and influences um, because we're really caught in that um, we're caught in the biomedical trap <laughs> for, for the majority of our day. Um, and, and I'm not saying that that means that all health workers are missing the point. That's definitely not what I'm saying. Um, but I think it's, it's really important for us to, to step back and, and to find ways to do that regularly um, rather than as kind of the exception. And so um, what has helped, one of the many tools that has helped me to do that is, is critical race theory and, and Dr. Chandra Ford's work applying critical race theory to public health um, through public health critical race praxis. Um, it's, you know, I mean, it's not every day that I can sit down and read theory, but at the same time, just a little dose of it really helps you to see 
um, make the make the invisible visible, I guess, as they say. Um, and I think for for what part of what's helpful for kind of uncovering um, the forces and inequities and bias and discrimination and structural racism um, at a hospital like Brigham and Women's, where we've been trying to to do that. People have been trying to do that for a very long time, but um, but most recently we've been trying to do that with our heart failure work. Um, mm -hmm. I think what helps is that critical race theory allows you to just start from the point of structural racism is here. It's within our walls. It's impacting how we take care of patients. It's impacting the resources our patients have at their disposal. Um, and so instead of trying to prove that it's here, starting from it's here, um, and then trying to understand the mechanism, uh, as, as Dr. Kamara Jones says, how is it operating? How is racism operating within our walls? And um, I think, you know, COVID is no different um, than heart failure in so many ways, right? I mean, um, it, for COVID, it was very obvious that black and brown people were the people who were um, the most impacted and more likely to be in the hospital and more likely to, to have complications and all of those things. Um, what happens usually is that we blame patients for that and say, oh, well, you should have taken your diabetes medications and you should have taken those high blood pressure pills and you should have lost some weight like we told you. Um, and in reality, the reason that there is an unfair distribution of chronic diseases uh, like diabetes and high blood pressure is because there's an unfair exposure to risk for black and brown communities. And that risk is described by, by what Jackie just said, right? All of those different layers at the, at the level of, of material conditions and social conditions in which people are living, right? And, and who gets to live where and why and for what reason. So, um, so I, I think that, that, uh, that critical race theory is helpful in that way. I also think that concrete examples um, like for, for what we found at, at Brigham and Women's in, in heart failure, which is the most common admission diagnosis in our hospital um, and looking at the fact that black and brown patients end up on the general medicine service instead of the specialty cardiology service at significantly different rates um, is an example of institutional racism. And, and you know, we use the definition of, of racism that Kamara Jones put forward, which is it's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on how one looks, which is what we call race, that unfairly advantages some and disadvantages others and, and saps the strength of the whole entire society. And so if you look at subspecialty care, cardiology care as a resource, um, then Black and Latinx patients being systematically excluded from access to that resource when they have heart failure. I mean, it, it, there's no more clear definition. And yet, uh, because of white fragility and because we are at a predominantly white institution uh, and because it's an institution whose practices have not always been welcoming of Black and Brown communities, um, there were a lot of people who fought that definition and fought um, that framing. And that's really unfortunate because we're just, we're, we're being truth tellers and defensiveness and fragility shows up anytime you talk about um, structural forces, historical marginalization, disadvantage, bias, discrimination, all of these things. Um, and, and yet it's the most important conversation we can be having in the midst of a pandemic that as Jackie said, has, has unearthed and, and shown and demonstrated and brought light to things that we've been trying to not see as a society for way too long. Um, so I, I think that those kinds of concrete examples in clinical care and in the clinical world just help health workers to have to face the truth. Um, often we, we consider it to be something bad happening out there, um, but we're, you know, we're, <laughs> uh, you know, we're health workers and our intentions are good and that's all that matters. And, and that's just not the case. It's funny, it's so reminiscent of uh, some of the work in complex systems theory on the technological side of the ledger around, you know, looking at the Exxon Valdez accident and the first instinct is to say, oh, it's human error. You know, the captain had been drinking. What's, it's a drunk captain, <laughs> personal responsibility. And then, a totally different approach, which says, well, let's look at the whole picture here. And what were the conditions that the company set that might be driving the captain to drink? And what redundancies might have been there so that there'd be support and et cetera, et cetera. And 
I heard that a little bit echoed in Margaret's question, which was, gosh, if we're not gonna just be looking at the specific and say, all right, here's a problem, get me a vaccine as quickly as possible, and then the problem will go away. It's, it's somehow much more embedded and structural. It gets to the question of, all right, where's the first step of a journey of a thousand miles to take, or is that illusory? I mean, I, I know with climate change and global warming, there's debate around whether people trying to take up individual habits to deal with their own CO2 footprint is kind of missing the forest for the burning trees, given the institutional, again, uh, ways in which uh, the problem arises. So I guess I, I wonder, uh, for both of you, you're thinking around, for somebody wanting to pitch in here and generally, what would a first step be, whether it's just as an interested citizen, is it kind of the equivalent of minimizing my carbon footprint, I'll wear a mask, I'll go down the public health checklist of things to do as a citizen, uh, or is it something broader? And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, if there's a new administration that wants to say, push through uh, a new bill of federal policy in the United States for relief, what would be one or more things you'd want to make sure we're in there to try as much as possible to mitigate this problem and possibly do so not by being COVID specific, but by being specific to the problems behind the problem? I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, maybe Jackie. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So there's so much there. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, so one, I think in terms of uh, the suite of policies that we need to be thinking about is that we, we really need to, to think transformationally. Like we can't continue to to just kind of tweak a system that fundamentally exists to favor um, uh, the one percent in some way, and so so whether we're talking about uh, policies like campaign finance reform, so that we actually get money out of politics, so we don't have policies that are literally bought by the highest bidder, <laughs> and 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 um, and in some cases, policy makers whose um, favor and votes are bought by, by um, moneyed interests. And so for, so definitely we have to restore a true democracy first and foremost. Um, and, and, and in terms of also kind of the systemic things, we need to think about how wealth works in this country and how wealth has, um, how how the, the the enclosure of wealth and and what has what has taken to do that um, has has actively harmed everything from objectifying folks to the extent that African folks were brought over to this country in the hulls of ships as cargo, and really um, this whole notion of Black Lives Matter is a fairly low bar, you know, to just matter, you know, is, um, and, it, and, it, and it's really rooted in the fact that, that the dehumanization of, of, of people, um, the vestiges of that are still very much there and the image that is ingrained in so many of our minds as of George Floyd with the, with the knee on his neck um, and in a, in a posture that is, is far less than human and humane. And so we have to think about the roots of what, what makes that happen. Um, and, and certainly the enslavement of African peoples started with the, 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 uh, the pursuit of, of wealth and power. And, um, and so for us to, to, to get anywhere, we have to really, again, face that, that reality and our policies need to, to govern away from that reality. When we look at the energy system, to have a, a system that is governed by, the, where, where the goal of the energy system is to make as much money as possible 
for uh, the already wealthy few versus the goal of the energy system to provide energy <laughs> to all, that in and of itself is, is obviously a, a, a big problem. And people like the grandmother in um, New Jersey who had her electricity shut off for non-payment in the dead of a heat wave and um, her son paid off her bill, but two days later, the system hadn't caught up to it and they shut off her electricity anyway. And she was dependent on a respirator in the dead of a, of a heat wave and she died. She paid the price of poverty with her life while that company that flipped that switch is making hundreds of millions of dollars in pure profit that they're using to lobby against clean air, to lobby against clean energy, to lobby, to, to pay into groups like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council that pushes, um, pushes on pr prison privatization, school privatization, water privatization, and pushes back on voter rights and advances voter suppression laws. So we have to recognize the interconnection of all of these issues and how they they all compile to oppress um, BIPOC communities in particular, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, and low-income communities in general. And therefore, when we think about policymaking, it has to be uh, systemic and it has to be transformational or we're gonna to continue to be in the state that we're in now. So that's kind of the answer to your second question in terms of the types of policies we need to look at. So everything from campaign finance reform to, to ways that we, we restructure uh, uh, the, our energy systems, ways that we restructure our food systems. We have a, a food system where we have companies that are so concentrating on, again, enclosure of wealth that they will create um, uh, products that are against the very laws of nature, like the terminator seeds that are, that are developed by Monsanto, one of the big agricultural groups. A terminator seed, which only has one life cycle, which again, this world is a, is, is, was designed divinely in, in terms of regenerative processes and so forth. And so the, the cycle of seeds is, is, a, is a natural um, way of the world, but yet we have folks who are actually genetically modifying the, the very laws of nature in some ways um, through developing these types of seeds. And again, it's all about the enclosure of wealth. And so we have people lining up in food lines where we can really be constantly regenerating um, our, our food systems. There's, there's no reason that anyone should be going without food. People should not be starving based on what they have in their pocket in a, in a land of plenty and our land is a, one of plenty and so we can really take each and every one of our systems and think of them that way and think about how do we have systems that actually um, provide for the commons for all as opposed to again being rooted in, in wealth and so but back to your other question too about what anyone can do um, small steps that people can take I put together this document called 20 Things We Can Do to Advance a Sustainable Planet um, on Earth Day a couple of years ago and posted it because out of that recognition that not everybody's gonna run for office, not everyone's gonna um, start a, a community microgrid, a lot of those kind of things that we all need to get to where we're gonna go. But anyone can, yeah, I was just on a panel yesterday where someone actually asked that very same question and, um, and they had put online uh, the, on social media a question like, what is something? What is what? What can I do that will take the least amount of effort? <laughs> Which I thought that was an interesting kind of question. But I was saying, actually, putting that question out there on social media is an act, like because it starts people thinking and it and it and it socializes some some remedies that people are putting out there. So just asking a question, just starting a conversation, um, is 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 an important step in and of itself, and one that, that anyone can do. But then I have started to grow for the first time in my life because I've traveled 99% of the time before this thing happened. Um, but I started to grow for the first time in my life on my balcony, a whole garden. So now I'm growing everything from lemons to, um, to tomatoes, to peppers, to dill, to cilantro and parsley. And that's something that I'm just doing on my tiny little condo um, um, balcony. And, and it's something that, you know, that now I, I made my bruschetta out of what I grew on my balcony, which I was super excited about. And so, um, and that's something that we, we can all 
all do. Um, thinking about, you know, taking that, taking that walk instead of driving. Like that's one thing that makes a difference because every every um, every time we have we run those combustion engines, it puts um, pollution in the air that that won't that that uh, that impacts the the way someone else breathes um, and and their ability to breathe. So. I'll stop there with my longest answer yet. But uh, <laughs> thank you. And it's a it's a neat um, way of saying that the incremental and the transformational don't have to be in opposition. That you know a, a path to transformation can be at times incremental, especially if you're trying to meet people where they're at. When the person asks you, "Well, what's something I could do?" but I don't have a lot of time. You know, I'm ready to applaud. Uh, our healthcare providers every night at 8 p.m. You yeah. know, it, 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 I hear you saying, you know, meet them there. And then maybe at 9 p.m., here's another suggestion if you happen to have time and go from there. Exactly. So I don't know, uh, Michelle, your thoughts on the same thing. Yeah, no, I think uh, really, really great questions. And, and again, lo loving what Jackie is saying and learning so much from how you're um, just weaving it all together, that spectrum together. I really appreciate that. And, and I think that's exactly the right approach. Um, I might go ahead and answer the policy question first and then get into the personal, um, which are connected, of course. Um, but I think from, from the policy side, there's so much. I think we're at a point where, in my opinion, at least, even asking for Medicare for all is too small. We need something. We need an even bolder, more visionary ask. Um, demand, I should say, um, that takes us even further than just health insurance. And, um, and I think that that's happening in lots of different sectors and, uh, and movement folks and organizers are, are really, um, we're, we're alive because of them right now. Um, and, and we should all be so thankful for, for the sacrifices that organizers are making. But, um, but again, the like medical communities behind the curve. I mean, what is our version of abolition? Um, what does that look like? I, I, I mean, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there. I think we need to be far bolder and far more visionary. And I think we need to, for the for the health and well-being aspects, we need to connect much more deeply and closely to our colleagues in other disciplines and in other spaces because I think we're um, we're a little bit stuck. Um, but at the same time, I think that there are like very real, very exciting policy proposals that are out there and. Um, and I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of the Ways and Means Committee, but, but I, you know, the, I think the BREATHE Act is very exciting um, that's been put forward by Movement for Black Lives. And I think there's a lot of other legislation out there that's very visionary um, that is going to take us somewhere, um, at, at least in our dreams, if not in the political reality um, of, of the current moment. Um, I'll also say that I think, you know, again, uh, critical race theory has really helped me on the policy side. Um, me and some colleagues wrote a piece a few months ago in Health Affairs talking about how interest convergence, which is one of the kind of sub, sub theories or tenets of critical race theory, um, helps us to understand, uh, you know, past changes um, and, you know, the, the example of um, Brown versus the Board of Education in the Supreme Court, um, which many people I think looking back see as, you know, a, a white awakening or, or white consciousness um, perhaps was not just a, uh, you know, a sudden consciousness <laughs> amongst white people, but actually, you know, again, an example of interests of civil rights leaders, organizers, and mobilizers aligning with the interests of whites for uh, a, a very interesting set of reasons. But if you, if you agree with that analysis, which I do, um, it makes you think, okay, so how does that inform our policy making and advocacy work going forward? Are we um, stuck waiting until interests align again with, you know, white elites um, who have always run this country? Or are we going to build an alternative? And I th what we describe in our health affairs piece is that, you know, health workers in particular, again, need to join the coalitions that are existing um, uh, for social justice uh, across the country and around the world. And we need to lend our voices and our power to those demands and those movements in coalition. And we need to build an alternative nexus of power um, if we are going to avoid having to sit around and wait until interests converge again. Um, and I think that it's, it's um, 
it's hard <laughs> to do that. And yet it's, it's critical. And that's how all social change, you know, through social movements has happened in the past. And I think that that's really um, instructive. Um, and then I think on the personal um, side, like what is a, what's a step that everyone can take um, towards, um, you know, uplifting what we're talking about in terms of racial justice and environmental justice. Um, oh, there's so many, right? There are thousands, there are thousands of great steps. In fact, I like, I myself am always trying to find new steps that I can take. Um, but I think particularly because this is my, you know, this is what Equal Health has really committed to over the past several years, I, I do think that the critical consciousness piece is the first most important step. I think it can be really damaging, um, in fact, if you haven't done that work of raising, uh, you know, your own consciousness and your critical lens and, um, and learning um, before entering into spaces with others who are already doing that work or are, or are, you know, have already been committed to that work. I think it's so important to do your homework first and what that homework looks like, you know, varies depending on who you are and where you sit and, and what your training is and, and what community you're from. But, um, but I think that all of us have to start with that internal um, step of acknowledging and humbly recognizing what we don't know um, and really being open-minded and curious and, and being willing to listen to truth tellers who are often unpopular and, you know, scrutinized and marginalized uh, uh, fairly or unfairly. But um, listening to those folks uh, who, uh, yeah, who may get labeled <laughs> as being uh, either too radical or too forward thinking or whatever it might be, um, there's, there's truth in those, in the words that they're speaking. And, um, and so I think getting out of our kind of, uh, you know, our, our typical knowledge silos is, is really, really helpful as a first step. That's fantastic. Um... I, I have to say, I, you know, after um, 2016, I, I, I uh, got a Twitter account and I have very mixed feelings about Twitter. Um, <laughs> very, very mixed feelings. But one of the things that it does, has allowed me to do is to actually, you know, to tune into conversations that I would not otherwise, and tune and listen to other voices I wouldn't, otherwise listen to um, that would take a lot of effort you know to listen to and I sort of can lurk and listen to these you know kind of subculture conversations and have at least a, a tiny bit of a feel for what folks that I would not necessarily um, interact with are sort of saying and most of the time it's a very frightening experience <laughs> and not very positive but um, but it also it does have that function which does lead me to sort of a, another um, sort of a, question and, you know, to circle back again a little bit, you know, for me, what has been so, so upsetting, I think, in terms of how, how COVID has played out is the, um, sort of the, the cruelty, the, uh, and the embracing of cruelty as a political strategy, um, uh, from our national leadership, um, and, you know, armed mask, um, masked, uh, you know, protests over masks, uh, you know, you definitely, I, I guess it's my opinion, but I think that it, if it had been anything, there would have been a, a protest um, and armed and, and it definitely, number one, uh, and, you know, number two, the sort of loss of life um, uh, in uh, minority communities, uh, sort of, um, you know, not being addressed and almost being, uh, encouraged, uh, refusing to take any public health action and uh, undermining every public health action that may have prevented uh, some of that or blunted that or mitigated it, I think was just, you know, just deeply, deeply upsetting. But, but I think the, um, the, the thing that that has made me kind of wonder about is, you know, is would things have really been any different under, uh, under a different uh, administration, um, you know, given the fact that these structural factors were in place, uh, and that this crisis hit, and these you know, this you know structural disadvantages and um, draining of resources out of uh, uh, out of communities that made them particularly uniquely vulnerable, that's a longstanding um, uh, 
thing. So maybe things would not have actually been different, but maybe I just would have felt better about them because I wouldn't have sort of seen the cruelty and I, I wouldn't have experienced personally uh, that, uh, that, 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 uh, the, the crisis in the, in, the, in the same way. So I guess that's my first, my question to you guys is to um, ask if you think it would have been different, um, if you would have felt differently about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I just give a small example uh, of what I mean by a structural longstanding issue that I discovered. So when I started working with the state of Massachusetts on the contact tracing program, we realized we were, um, I was working with Partners in Health, which is a nonprofit here that was uh, contracted with the state to help build out the contact tracing program. And of course, a contact tracing program is when you uh, um, identify people who have um, who are infected and, and find out the, the people they may have exposed to the disease and then reach out to them and, and help them uh, quarantine um, and to keep them from passing on the infection to others. And what we found was, you know, as we were going about building the contact tracing program, we were going to need to work with 351 local boards of health that our public health system in the state of Massachusetts was set up so that there were uh, municipalities and towns ran local boards of health that had contact tracing programs already in them that needed to be bolstered. And, and that's a little unusual. Usually it's done by county, not by municipality or town, but nevertheless, it was run by you know, 351 local boards of health. And how did they get paid? What was the revenue stream for those local boards of health? It was property taxes. And I remember learning that in, in, in March and just feeling like the floor opening up from under me. I, I, I just, I can't even describe how upsetting that fact was because that meant of course, you know, that, that communities that were going to be relying on their local boards of health you know, the communities uh, that couldn't pay property taxes, you know, were going to be uh, starting from an even deeper hole uh, than the rest of us. And it's just a little vignette to say like, that was, that was the whole, you know, those were, those, that was in place before 2016. Um, we still would have been dealing with that. But, um, I, so I just offer that as an example, but I would, I would, I guess I'd love to hear from you guys what what you, would things have been different if the outcome of the 2016 election were different. <laughs> I will ask Michelle to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you don't feel like answering that, I could I could modify. Oh, it. I I appreciate the question, and I think it's um, it's an important one, and I think it's one. I I just hope that. Um, we don't lose that perspective um, when the new administration starts. I, I worry that, um, you know, just sometimes we can be so short-sighted that even remembering that something that recent um, can be overlooked. And um, I would also say that, you know, ultimately, I think it would have been significantly different for sure. Um, I think the, like, the direct answer to the question is yes. Um, and I think that, you know, the projections, of course, that looked at if we had, if we had, um, you know, uh, uh, enacted social distancing and stay at home orders a few weeks earlier, how many lives would have been saved and some of those things, uh, some of those projections are, again, why, why I, my word was tragedy. Um, you know, it, there was so much that could have been done differently early on before that amplification effect happened, let alone what's happening in these past couple of months this fall. Um, so I, I think, yes, it would have been different. Um, significantly different. I also think um, that administration of uh, uh, the, I think it, I think this would have been a challenge for any administration, um, no matter the party. Um, and I think the approaches would have been drastically different, but I think it would have been very, very difficult for any administration to manage a, um, a crisis of this magnitude. Um, I worry the most, of course, about the, the, the global effects and, and not just vaccine nationalism, but nationalism period, um, and how we work our way 
out of that, um, how we repair from that, how we acknowledge um, that, how we rebuild um, uh, uh, global relationships and how we, I hope, practice global solidarity differently because I also don't want us to go back to, um, you know, very security only oriented approaches to global health. I, I think that it's really important that we recognize that global solidarity can be practiced in a lot of different ways and they don't have to, it doesn't have to be imperial and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, militarized. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that's a dream that will ever be fulfilled, but, um, but I think, I hope that that's part of also what happens as we think forward um, as, as well. I also hope that, um, you know, that part of the recognition um, of how things might've been different is really what um, guides the, the forward thinking visionary next steps of the new administration and um, that it not just be kind of a uh, let's just reverse everything that's happened for the past four years but can we really dream a new vision and do things um, differently rather than just fix um, fix some of what's happened over the past four years. I think um, certainly there's fixing that needs to be done but also there's, there's clearly um, more um, creative, uh, liberatory um, dream work that needs to happen if we're gonna ever have a chance of preventing this same pattern that we're seeing with COVID from playing out in the next pandemic. And the next pandemic, I'm sure Jackie is gonna say, is coming way sooner um, than we think. So uh, I hope that some of that will happen going forward. And before uh, Jackie will get what might well be the last word uh, given our timing, uh, Margaret's question and your answer, Michelle, really nicely connect to one of our participants' questions uh, about that vision, which may not just be about a hypothetical, well, what if it had been a different administration, but looking to other jurisdictions, whether a particular American state or a different country elsewhere in the world that maybe offers some insight into how to do things better. Um, and I'm curious if anything uh, for either of you jumps to mind on uh, the way the question put it was comparative cases, both within and outside the US, hospital systems making incremental progress, other cultures or governments making inroads for better quality of life for people of color as a background to medical care. And I don't know if there's anything that stands out as uh, an example to emulate. I'll, I'll just be really fast because I, I think you want to go to to Jackie. Um, I, the, the countries that I think we don't hear enough about are Cuba, um, for sure, um, and and Vietnam. Both, I think, are, um, you know, are places I would like to be hearing more about. And I'll say that I haven't looked at uh, uh, the numbers in South Korea um, in a while, and I, I recognize that there have been some more recent challenges. But um, but I think that there's there's something to be learned um, for sure. And then the, la the tiny last thing I would say is just that um, there is also evidence that um, ending the racial wealth gap through reparations for formerly and for descendants of formerly enslaved people actually would be a very effective way to change tra transmission of COVID. In fact, and um, projections that researchers uh, and collaborators that I know um, have looked at uh, suggest that actually COVID transmission in Louisiana, which was the, the test case, um, would have been 30 to 68 percent lower um, for the whole entire state if the racial wealth gap had been eliminated before the COVID-19 pandemic started. So um, no country has really done that yet, um, but, but that would be uh, almost as good as the, the floor that the FDA has set for vaccine efficacy. So um, I think we need to be thinking about things like that. Mm. Thanks. Jackie? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so definitely echoing what um, Michelle said, absolutely, the, the, the racial wealth gap is the root of so much um, that, that addressing the racial wealth gap, gap is, is critical. Um, I recently bought the book that I had read a little bit online, um, The Geography of Bliss, um, which I don't know if folks have heard of that, but, but it really looked at, I mean, people have heard of this notion of the happiness index and so forth. And it really went around, this person really went around the world really asking people what, what's making them happy, um, what is giving them fulfillment and so forth. And one thing that that geography of bliss 
um, revealed is places that have the, the lowest level of, of, um, of, racial, of, of wealth disparity are the places that are enjoying the, the most bliss. And it doesn't mean that everyone's rich. <laughs> it just means that there is equity across the board. And some of the places that, that even have the lowest in the way, way of you know, gross national project product or whatever are, um, are, are, um, are places that are experiencing more in the way of fulfillment and, and happiness. And I think we, there's a lot to be drawn from lessons from those countries in terms of how they structure and how do they how do they govern in a way that makes sure that everyone has their basic needs met which is really um and and the ways that it um that it value the values that are at the center of governance in those nations um are something that we definitely need to to look at <laughs> so i'll just keep it simple <laughs> geography of bliss i highly recommend <laughs> thank you that sounds that sounds like what we what we need to um, all just read <laughs> right now, given this given this very dark winter that we are about to live through. Um, and I just want to wrap up by saying an enormous thank you to both of you uh, for for sharing what you've learned and um, you know what your perspective is at this at this really critical moment. And I, you know, I've. Um, I, I was watching uh, uh, the Shakespeare, um, Henry V, where he says, you know, he's the end of the movie, he says that he's um, about to kiss his uh, newly won French bride. And she says, no, 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 we cannot kiss because that would be bad manners. And he says, oh, we are the makers of manners. Of course we can kiss. And I often think about, we are the makers of manners. And so to whatever extent that this uh, moment um, uh, helps us think about what we'd like in the future to remind ourselves that we uh, have some control and agency over that future. And I'm so thrilled that you guys are part of that, <laughs> the, that future and that future creation uh, with us. So thank you so much. Indeed. Thanks very much. I'm sorry there's not an urn with stale coffee for us to gather around with uh, <laughs> everyone and the participants, but uh, we'll see you online and we will press forward and try to move beyond uh, devastating. <laughs>